The work done by health workers during the pandemic has been impeccable. In part two of CGTN's Pandemic Warrior series, we illuminate their heroism. Throughout 2020, the coronavirus has tested human intelligence. It's stretched the world's resources and put greater demands on all of us. In fact, more than anything else during peacetime. And like soldiers to war, they are frontline workers who have constantly thrown themselves in harm's way. Many of them paying the ultimate price. That's right, Lindy. Many have paid the ultimate price and this war cannot be fought without them. In our continuing series, CGT and Pandemic Warriors, we'll feature those who are on the battlefront, those that strive to support them, and some of those that have survived because of the sacrifices healthcare workers around the world have made. Well, indeed, and there are examples across the continent, but let's for now start in Egypt. With a population of 100 million people, doctors in Egypt have had an immense responsibility when facing this pandemic. Since the country first reported cases in March, they've been on the front line, barely taking a single day off. Well, today we feature two doctors from the Ain Shams University Hospital. Dr. Samair Girgis is the deputy manager who faithfully reports to the COVID-19 dedicated facilities each day, while also fighting to ensure that she doesn't bring the virus home to her 70-year-old parents. And her colleague, Dr. Walid Abdallah, also has to keep his three young girls safe while staying true to his critical duties at the hospital. Here's CGTN's Adel al Makhroui with that story. Dr. Samia Girgis is on her way to work. She is the deputy manager of Ain Shams University Hospitals Group. Consisting of 12 hospitals and clinic, one of her duties is to personally inspect the operation in each medical facility she assists in running. We follow her as she prepares to enter a place most of us would not dare to go, the COVID-19 field hospital. As head of the infections control unit, Dr. Gerges has been in the front line of the battle against the virus since Egypt first reported cases in March. When we learned that it's becoming a pandemic, we summoned all our medical teams and created a crisis plan. We selected one of our hospitals to be dedicated for quarantine and treatment. We wrote a plan to turn our students' dorms and senior homes into COVID-19 facilities if the infections increase, how we will increase beds in the field hospitals. Dr. Walid Abdullah is the manager of this field hospital. He works alongside Dr. Gerges in facing the pandemic. I met him inside this COVID-19 dedicated unit where he's been working around the clock almost non-stop. Before the starting of the pandemic, you have to be prepared. Uh, before starting of a second wave, that it seems that it has started right now, okay, you have to be prepared. As you can see here, we, is, we started our capacity increased. We started to, uh, to prepare our stuff from different, uh, for, from different departments. Okay, even those who are not well trained as a frontliner, okay, they have a short course of training and they are participating right now. When was the last time you took a vacation? Mm, I don't remember. <laughs> Actually, I don't remember. Ain Shams University has about 3,000 doctors who serve some 1.5 million patients annually. More work has been required from them during the pandemic. They're now under paramount pressure especially when many of them fell victims to the disease. You can see a friend uh, intubating or putting his friend on a mechanical ventilation. Okay, uh, he, he knows it's a very stressful situation for, uh, for physicians when they are dealing with the disease and when they are dealing with their colleagues as a patient. Uh, this uh, will add further stress actually. You are facing both a disease and your fear. You are afraid that you might be infected and you can transmit infection for your, uh, for, for your family. When you ask for their service after all of that, they will say yes. They served the COVID-19 hospitals many, many times. No one ran away from this commitment. They are not afraid.
Nurse Rahab is one of those medical staff. She got infected on duty. Luckily, her symptoms are under control. She tells me that when she's cured, she will resume her services here. In the ICU, beeping of ventilators, heart monitors, and oxygen level machines echoes the space. All patients here are in critical conditions, some worse than others. Nabil Nawar can barely take a proper deep breath. Speaking is great effort to him. Yet when he saw us, he insisted to talk. He wanted to thank the doctors serving in this facility. Extremely polite, always alert and exert enormous effort, he tells me. Since we started practicing medicine here in Egypt, it's about um, at least 20 years ago, uh, we didn't see something like that. As regards uh, the spread of uh, the number of cases, the burden on the healthcare system, uh, this is the first time to face something like that. Dr. Gerges lives with her parents. Both of them are over 70. Dr. Abdullah is a father of three young daughters. With their presence here, all these amazing warriors are putting their lives and the ones they care most about at risk in order to save lives of their fellow countrymen from the disease. Sumaya Hosani, a doctor originally from Africa, is getting a lot of attention in Wenzhou City in southeastern China. And that's because she's been helping in a fight against the coronavirus pandemic both in China and in her home country of Mauritius. This is her story. Wearing protective clothing, Sumaya takes passengers' temperatures. Although she's from Mauritius, she talks to people in fluent Mandarin. Sumaya came to study in China 12 years ago. She and her husband, also a doctor, Abdul Zahir Hamad from Pakistan, have built a life in China. In February, during the coronavirus outbreak in China, she and Abdul chose not to leave. Instead, they joined a team of anti-epidemic volunteers. For 22 days, they screened the temperatures of thousands of passengers passing through a highway toll in Wenzhou. We really wanted to contribute our part and we thought no matter what, how small it was. I worked with uh, policemen, with nurses, with other doctors from other hospitals and even um, on ground level with the people. So I felt the connection and now I feel I'm more part of the culture, I'm more part of the country. The Mauritian media quickly picked up Sumaya's story. At first, her family in Mauritius was trying to persuade her to return home. But now, they're encouraging her to stay on. On March 18th, Mauritius diagnosed its first cases of COVID-19. What followed were rumors and misinformation across the island nation. In response, Sumaya decided to post a video on social media. If you wear glasses, you need to press the upper part of the mask on the bridge of the nose like this. Drawing from her experiences and knowledge gained in China, she shared information on how to prevent being infected and spreading the virus to others. In her video, Sumaya shows the correct way of wearing masks and gloves. She explains what it means to be an asymptomatic patient. She also urges viewers to adhere to lockdown rules. Sumaya said her experience in China won her the trust and support from followers. On learning that Mauritius urgently needed prevention supplies, Sumaya approached the medical center where she worked for help. Her request not only received a positive response from her employer, but also the city government, and a fundraiser was launched. We're facing this disaster, this challenge of mankind together. We cannot ignore the difficulties Mauritius is experiencing, not to mention the tremendous efforts and contributions made by Sumaya for Wenzhou and China. On April 18th, medical supplies from China arrived in Mauritius, including masks, protective clothing and temperature guns. The Mauritian foreign minister praised the anti-epidemic cooperation between the two countries. 
China has been very supportive. We have had uh, a number of donations from the government of China. Uh, we have learned a lot from what has happened in, in, in China, and uh, we have continued with the with the um, with our collaboration. China went out of its way to really to really help with this pandemic, and we want to get rid of the virus, irrespective of which part of the continent you're from, which country you're from, which race you you are. It's just we are all as people, and we're fighting this war together. That certainly is quite the compelling story there, Lindy. The thing that this pandemic really has brought out is that there's seemingly no end to the amount that we will sacrifice in the face of a common, uh, compelling tragedy. Mm, absolutely. And when it comes to sacrifice, journalists themselves have been faced with an interesting dilemma. On the one hand, you want to interact with people. You want to step into communities in order to tell the true story of this pandemic. But on the other hand, you have to consider your own safety and well-being. Absolutely. And there's a lot more nuance layers that actually come in on top of that because you know you walk into these communities you actually step out of the office into the real world and some of the things that we encounter pretty challenging you know this uh, adherence to wearing masks for example which you face when you're doing some of your stories yeah. uh, as well that isn't as you don't have that 100% compliance that you'd expect yeah. And the nuanced reasons for that. Exactly. I mean, a lot of people are far more concerned with the economic consequences of this pandemic than they are about the reality of the virus itself and what it can do. And so journalists then have this predicament in which you have two responsibilities, one in which you must tell the story from this community, but at all times, not only for your own safety, you must wear your mask because you have to, in a sense, reinforce the reality of this coronavirus pandemic and decisions that are certainly catching the attention of those at the forefront of this disease. A Congolese professor who was instrumental in the fight against Ebola is now applying that experience to the fight against the coronavirus pandemic. In fact, Professor Steve Ahoka believes that key to fighting this pandemic is addressing misunderstandings on COVID-19 amongst the general public. He says it's critical in suppressing the spread of the disease. Well, CGTN's Chris Ochamringa has his story. Professor Steve Ahoka heads the virology department at the National Institute of Biomedical Research in Kinshasa. Earlier this year, he was charged with coordinating health teams to help stop the spread of coronavirus in the country. What we are proud is the capacity for Congolese, as I said, to over, over, overcome those, uh, you know, the fact that the country sometimes is not very stable, but we succeed. For example, when we, we are managing uh, Ebola in the Western, we, we have been attacked by uh, armed group, but we try to maintain, you know, public health activities, and finally we succeed to stop the outbreak. The DRC has recorded an increase in COVID-19 cases after the government eased its lockdown in August. The first cases of the pandemic sparked a lot of fear, suspicion and uncertainty among the public and misinformation about the disease spread at the speed of the virus, something that Professor Ahuka believes can hinder the efforts to curb the spread. He therefore got busy coordinating activities on the ground to help alleviate these misconceptions in the society. Thanks to our activities, uh, thanks to the fact that we, we aimed to commit people, and now we are having uh, less you know, resistance, less misunderstanding. People are more, you know, uh, uh, are more committed. Uh, but, of course, you know, there are always some people who are not, you know, believing that uh, COVID-19 is, you know, a very uh, threat for, uh, for us. DRC's capital, Kinshasa, is the epicenter of the outbreak, with over 11,000 cases since March. Many here don't believe COVID-19 exists. The government has now imposed a curfew and tightened measures to limit the spread of the disease. Health officials who've worked with Professor Ahuka praise him for his contribution in tackling the pandemic. He is the incident manager. He played a great role in supporting Professor Muyembe, the head of the National Task Force in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. He's ensured that testing kits are available and other activities are done well. 
The DRC's National Institute of Biomedical Research is at the forefront of the fight against COVID-19. It's been plagued by logistical challenges due to the numerous epidemics that the country has had to deal with over the past two years. But Professor Ahuka is still striving to put his best foot forward. Let's turn now to today's installment of Voices of the People and have a listen to some of the lessons learned from the pandemic. COVID-19 is so, we learned how to work together, the way to do what we are capable of without outside help. There were no foreign doctors, whether it's Italian or Turkish, who are helping Somalia's health sector. Every suspected COVID-19 case was sent to Martini Hospital with only Somali doctors operating there. All the senior and junior doctors and the nurses in the hospital were Somalis. So, we can say that COVID-19 was a wake-up call to all of us. We learned that we possess the power to work for our people, the power to save our people, and if we cooperate, we will never fail. There is a need to really step up on the research and uh, come up with innovations that uh, can help the citizenry irrespective of their domicile. Battling COVID-19 has left many with emotional and physical scars that may very well have long-term consequences. But uh, those who got infected and survived are overwhelmingly left with a great sense of gratitude that they did make it through. Indeed, and it is important to point that out. Lots of people did survive COVID-19. Here's the GTN's Enoch Sikolia bringing you the story of one such survivor, Benson Musungu. He paints a very vivid picture of what it's like to be fighting for your life for days, unable to breathe naturally and having to depend on ventilators for your next breath. He fought, he survived, and this is his story. It's been nearly three months since Benson Musungu walked into the Aga Khan University Hospital in Nairobi for treatment. Uh, immediately I got at the reception, my breath went out and after that, of course, they took me straight to the ICU. And uh, my that time my diagnosis was maybe I have pneumonia. And that pneumonia was very chronic because it was taking away my breath. That would change after a COVID-19 test turned positive. At this time, Musungu had already been placed on oxygen therapy for the ventilators to support his now weak lungs. Initially, they had connected me to the normal oxygen. Yes, they just oxygen wires, then it was not working. I needed more oxygen, so they had to connect me to a ventilator. And uh, yeah, that is what kept me alive for some time. Musungu narrates why he thinks the virus almost took him to the brink. When I was still at home first, I, I lost um, appetite for a long time. Nearly eight days, I was not eating. I was not even going to the loo. So I had nothing in my body. So this COVID found my body when it was very, when it was very weak. My, my system was very low. For 15 days, Musungu was on a ventilator. The medical team at the Khan Hospital was hopeful, but uncertain of his future. Every day they could uh, remove blood from me, uh, morning, lunchtime, and in the evening. So all these tests, they run to see how, how, how am I, how, how is my system uh, behaving. Yeah, behaving with the drugs that they're putting on me. And they're putting me different drugs. None of his relations, nor workmates, were allowed to see him in the ICU. It was a lonely battle against a highly contagious virus that was leaving a trail of death globally. His doctors, nurses and cleaners were his only companions. But again, he only knew them by names written on their PPEs. And when that person comes in that place, you can't see them. You only see, you can only hear their voice because they are protecting themselves against this virus. I saw people who were treating me the last day I was leaving hospital when they were coming around my hospital bed because I had now uh, conf been confirmed now negative after 22 days. So that the first time I could I say, yeah, you are the lady, you are the doctor who, who was taking blood from me because I can hear that of the voice. 
Besides feeling weak and unable to walk, Musungu felt later he lost a lot of weight. He says his story is that of back from the brink. Many people still deny the existence of COVID-19 and many Kenyans go about their business without putting on a face mask or maintaining social distance. But having survived the disease, Benson Musungu now advocates even more for people to protect themselves against the virus. Enoxicolia, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Philanthropy and activism have helped the continent keep its head above the water even as a COVID-19 pandemic threatened to completely overwhelm public health care systems that are often underfunded and overstretched. Now, one of the most striking examples, Rama, came out of South Africa. As we know, the country implemented one of the world's strictest lockdowns to curb the spread of the coronavirus. And some of these measures, in fact, battered the economy, leaving millions of people facing both hunger and unemployment. Indeed, and we, of course, did report on these stories, and the data coming out of South Africa was fairly grim. That said, under the umbrella of Cape Town, Together, various neighborhood networks right across the city joined forces to help those in need. Today, we'll take a look at the community of Salt River, where one activist, Dr. Leon Brady, and other selfless volunteers came together against all the odds to feed the hungry while bridging the divides of race and class. Here's CGTN's Julie Shire with that story. South Africa's lockdown laid the country's inequalities bare. A reality lived daily by Salt River residents, a suburb located east of Cape Town. Health activist Dr. Leanne Brady, together with a team of Salt River volunteers, started a veggie garden during the lockdown to feed those in need. There's two, there's another one at the back. My name is Leanne Brady. I'm part of the Public Ambulance Service and part of the Salt River CAN, which is part of a broader network across Cape Town that started as a rapid community-led response to the COVID pandemic. In a city as divided as Cape Town, as unequal as Cape Town, it was important to recognize that this pandemic affects all of us, but it doesn't affect all of us equally. Salt River's Veggie Garden joins over 150 community action networks known as CANs that sprung across the city in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. Every can is different, but they all work as a part of the Greater Cape Town Together initiative. I am Marius. Um, I live here in Salt River and I'm a part of this beautiful garden and I'm a part of yeah, initiating and building it. During COVID, uh, like the, the, the stark food insecurity in our neighborhood really came to, to surface. We realized that there was a dire need for food in the community and just everybody just rallied around beautifully and I think that's the power of people getting together. It was always our vision, Marius and I, our vision to do a food garden. I was approached by Leanne Brady and we got chatting about um, how that garden was started and then she had the idea for a food garden. We haven't had a sort of a, a global um, disaster of the scale since World War II. So we're living through extraordinarily difficult times. In Salt River, we, we kind of, we started this veggie garden. There was also a bunch of other things, uh, food distribution. We have a large kind of homeless population in Salt River and many more people were pushed onto the streets during lockdown. And so there was a food distribution program that the Salt River Can also ran. In times of need, you have to reach out. You think you are in a bad situation, the person next door or further away of the other communities, it's in a worse scenario. I really do this from my heart. I think when, when one is involved, you sort of see the need. You always hear it's on TV, but when you're involved, you see the cries of the people, you see the hunger. Kelly Ann is a fantastic person. She's driven. She's definitely a leader. Um, she got the community together and got everybody to have the same sort of passion, uh, uh, to drive, to sort of get into this veggie garden. I think there's a lot of things that we need to learn from this pandemic and it's teaching us how we, we should be shaping our society and those lessons are being developed from the bottom up. 
because we're not out of the woods and there is talk of a second wave, I think the need is going to be greater where food supply is concerned. So definitely I would um, do what I'm doing and try to the best of my ability to sort of just give a little to, to our community. There are over 2,000 volunteers registered in about 150 community action networks across Cape Town and these neighborhood-based groups have responded in unique and diverse ways, making sure no one goes hungry. Those certainly are refreshing stories there, Lindy. And talking of refreshing moments, the fact is nature took quite a rare break, given by all these lockdowns around the world, to get a proverbial fresh of breath airs. We human beings, all 7 billion of us, mostly stayed home. A well-deserved break for nature. And that brings us to our next segment, Pandemic's Gift to Nature. Today, we take a look at animals. So as lockdowns took effect, it would seem that creatures big and small emerged from their nook and crannies to reclaim their rightful place on this earth. Indeed, they certainly did. And in many different ways and in many different places, as all of these lovely pictures will show you. Let's start here in Wales and Landudno. I love this picture. These wild goats happily roaming the streets of Wales without a care in the world. You could actually caption that with, where are all the humans? Because, <laughs> because they all disappeared at some point in time in, in some pretty severe lockdowns across the UK. Pretty much the same thing happened uh, in England as well. This particular shot was taken in Essex. Uh, the deer just sitting around. I mean, this is basically in, you know, a housing area. And they're like, yeah, well. I mean, the camera person must have been quite close. And they didn't even move nothing. They're just very, very comfortable. This, this is basically them saying, look, human, this is our space. You guys need to go away now. <laughs> exactly. What's amazing also is this picture coming out of India, the olive ridley turtles on the beach. Now, there are a number of species, uh, turtle species that are becoming endangered, some very close to extinction. But what we can see here is that these populations have been able to thrive. They've been reproducing and they're out in their numbers now, happily enjoying the beach. And of course, we've got the civet, critically endangered species, uh, malium om omnivore, I believe. Um, if you're a coffee lover, you will definitely know exactly what this little guy is all about. But here he is, wandering around uh, in, in Delhi <laughs> when that country implemented its very strict lockdowns. And it, it's a tease. Absolutely. This is all a lot of good news for many critically endangered species around the world. Indeed, it certainly is. And now here's some more images, not just this lot, but from the pandemic that are likely to be part of our collective history for generations to come. Well, tomorrow we come to our final episode of Pandemic Warriors. We will feature a few more stories about those who did not cower from uncertainty and fear. The warriors who've been waking up each day to keep society functioning, even as most of the world sheltered in place. Back to you in studio. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for that, Lindy and Rama. Well, that's it for this edition of Africa Live. Remember that you can send your feedback to the contacts on the screen and follow us on digital media platforms. From me, Hannah Vivier, and the rest of the Africa Live team, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again next time.